Welcome to the next video in the Search for Better Health topic. This video will be looking at syllabus.9.4.23, identify the conditions under which an organism is described as a pathogen. So what are pathogens and why are they referred to as this term pathogens? So the definition of pathogen is an organism or an infective agent that lives in or on another living organism and causes disease. So the big thing we need to get away from that I've mentioned in a previous video is we need to stop referring to infectious diseases as diseases, sorry, diseases that can be passed from one individual to another. We need to get into the habit of referring to infectious diseases as those that are caused by pathogens. Okay, so obviously the pathogens are able to be called, uh, sorry, transmitted from one person to another, which we'll be having a look at in a second in this video. But that is the key to an infectious disease, it is, as it is one that is caused by a pathogen. So the pathogen must be under the right conditions to multiply and be transmitted in order for it to be able to survive and obviously cause a disease in a living organism. So there are a number of different types of pathogens, some of which you've probably heard of before and some of which you haven't. So bacteria are probably our most common along with our viruses. So we hear about bacteria and viruses quite often. We also have fungi. Now the important thing to know is not all fungi are pathogenic. So obviously mushrooms that we eat are not uh, normally pathogenic. They can sometimes contain pathogenic um, organisms themselves and cause people to get sick or diseased. But the normal mushrooms, field mushrooms that we eat are not pathogenic. Then we also have protozoans, which are single cell organisms like amoeba. So um, there's an amoebic disease that has been talked about quite a lot at the moment in the news where it uh, lives in warm waterways and it's gotten in gets up in um, people's through sorry, up into people's brains through their noses when they dive or sort of are swimming around in this water and can actually cause quite severe brain disorders. Then we have parasites. So we have different types of parasites. We have endoparasites that live inside the body and ectoparasites that live outside the body. Again, not necessarily disease causing, but majority of the time they are. And lastly, we have prions, which are probably the least common of the pathogens and probably ones that you may never have heard of before unless you've heard of mad cow disease, which is actually caused by a prion, and we'll have a look at that a little bit later. So there are a number of conditions that are needed for a pathogen to be able to cause disease. So firstly, it needs to have virulence. So what do we mean by virulence? Basically, it means that there needs to be lots of these pathogens present in order to be able to cause disease. So a single bacteria of a pathogenic nature is not going to cause, cause a disease. But if that um, bacteria, if we then look at the second dot point, enters your body and is able to survive without being destroyed, then it will then multiply and then the numbers will get to the point where they overtake a particular part of our body and then that's what leads to disease. A lot of the time pathogens destroy cells or tissues depending on the type of pathogen. Viruses in particular cannot survive unless they actually overtake a cell within our body. They're able to escape from one host to another and survive this transmission. And as we'll be looking at in a second, different pathogens have different forms of transmission and transmission can be direct, indirect, or by a vector. So let's have a look at some transmission of diseases. So firstly, the one that we probably hear about the most is the transmission of disease through the air. Okay, so as we know, air contains gases, water vapor, dust particles, and also lots and lots of microbes. So when an infected individual, usually somebody with a cold is the most common one, breathes out, coughs or sneezes, then more of these pathogens are released into the air. And if you're within a close enough proximity, then you can inhale those microbes into your system by breathing through your mouth or through your nose, and then they're able to in enter your body and then cause disease in your particular systems. Next, we have water. So if water isn't purified or if there isn't a proper sewerage system, it can be a potential source of disease. So this is a common situation in many developing nations, just like the picture there. So in a lot of developing nations, they don't have a sewage network like we do. They don't have the luxury of being able to go to a toilet, push the button and it flushes it off and it gets treated at a sewage treatment uh, plant. 
it's all of our sewage in Australia is con well, majority of Australia in the, uh, the urban areas of Australia is contained within pipes. So we never see it. Um, the bacteria and things that are all, all associated with the fecal matter that we produce are all contained and there's no real issue about our water becoming contaminated. However, in the past, we have had a situation where Sydney's water was heavily contaminated and people needed to boil their water in before that they were able to consume it um, to drink out of the tap. So uh, water obviously being a moist environment is a great area for um, microbes to reproduce and especially if the water is a little bit warmer then it's almost ideal conditions for the reproduction of bacteria and things. So food, uh, any of you that work in a fast food outlet will know that there's a lot of requirements for people that are involved in food handling and preparation. So as we can see from the pictures, um, probably not so much mouth, uh, face masks and things, but aprons, protective clothing, hair nets, gloves, using particular types of equipment for particular types of food all helps to stop the transfer of microorganisms from food. Okay, so cooking food or refrigerating food also helps to stop the, the uh, microbes from multiplying because at low temperatures, they're unable to multiply. And at high temperatures, above 50 to 60 degrees, they basically die. So direct contact. So between infected and uninfected individuals is a common way uh, disease is transmitted. So for example, we've heard of many sexually transmitted infections that are transmitted through sexual contact. Also basic touching of some particular diseases can be transferred that way and kissing. So the kissing disease, glandular fever, mumps, you can get um, from the direct contact of kissing each other. Basically what happens is the transfer of saliva from one mouth to the other carries those nasty pathogens with it. We can also have indirect contact. So surfaces, um, just inanimate surfaces, tabletops, mobile phones, and as it says there, linen, showers and swimming pools can be sources of pathogens if they have been used by an infected person. Now it's believed that our mobile phones and the steering wheels in our cars, as well as the keyboards on our computers, are the most populated with bacterium, the, the, the surfaces that are the most populated with, with bacterium because you know you're holding the phone against your face you're holding you're touching it all the time people use their phone when they're in the bathroom same with your um, steering wheel in the car so these areas are huge harbors for uh, bacteria but remember not all of them are pathogenic so it's not necessarily a bad thing okay vectors so these are organisms so actual animals that transmit disease um, to or between individuals of another species so in the picture there, we can see a mosquito. So mosquitoes are the vectors of the disease malaria. Malaria is caused by a protozoan, so a single-celled organism. And when uh, the mosquito stings or bites a, a person that is infected with malaria, it draws the blood up into their system. Then when it flies to a person that's uninfected, what actually happens is a mosquito will first inject a small amount of the blood that it has in its system into a person before it then draws blood. So that's how we have the transfer of malaria. The other one there is a, a rat, which was the vector that caused the massive outbreak of the plague. Okay, so the, the rats carried the plague uh, pathogen, and as it was traveling through the slums, it would bite people and therefore transfer the disease from one person to another. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching.